Hi everyone, welcome to Flip Video 3.1. We're going to be taking a look at the rise of the Roman Empire. So go ahead and put at the top of your notes what were the key features of the Roman Empire because we're going to see how this, uh, this place was organized politically, socially, economically and ultimately ending by looking at some of the factors that lead to its uh, ultimate fall. So where we left off our story in class, is we, in class we discussed the fall of the Roman Republic which can be traced to the assassination of Julius Caesar. And when he, Caesar is assassinated on the floor of the Senate, that immediately leads to a civil war over power to fill that void that Caesar has left. Um, and in the end, Octavian, who was Caesar's adopted nephew, was the one to emerge as the leader. From this moment on, I'm actually going to refer to Octavian now as Augustus, which is the title that he was given. Augustus means exalted one, but he was known as Augustus. He actually preferred a different title, which we're about to get to, but Augustus is now the key figure who emerges uh, as the leader of the, what is no longer the Roman Republic, but will be called the Roman Empire. Now, technically speaking, uh, the, the politically Rome under the empire is still a republic in the beginning, but the emperor had all of the real power. So it's not a real shift. Not a, um, it is a quick shift, ultimately, to from this idea of a republic to the idea of one single leader with concentrated power. Now, one little quick note. Uh, I just think it's kind of interesting to see the evolution of the term that you and I know as the word emperor. Where that actually came from is Augustus, the title that he preferred was uh, principes, which was the, t the term that meant chief citizen among the peoples. So he saw that that title just simply means that he is the leader in essence. But he was also the military commander, just like President Obama is the military commander, in addition to being president as the uh, head of the executive branch of the government. As his role as the military leader, when he when troops were when a leader was victorious in battle, the troops the troops would call him uh, Im imperator, and as a reflection and a sign of that victory that they just had in battle. That imperator actually evolved into the term that we now know as emperor. So that uh, helps us understand not only the political role of the emperor, but also the military significance of the emperor. So that's just a little aside that helps us understand the political role of Augustus um, in this way. Brief chart that you're welcome to copy down on the right-hand side of your notes. Uh, but not required to. Just want to quickly elaborate on the differences between the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire, politically speaking. Under the Roman Republic, the officials were elected and they were in power for one year, and a new leader would take power by being appointed by the Senate. But we see that there is a clear shift here and a clear centralization of power, because under the Roman emperor, Empire, the emperor is the leader for life, and they, you, you only became a new emperor by inheriting power or by taking power. So you can see that we have a centralized centralization of the power, that we have an inheritance that an increasing amount of force is associated with this power. You got it. Yep. Sorry. Um, okay. So that's the um, the sh political shifts that we see, but they're also just generally speaking a larger social shift and societal shift, and that that's because Augustus his rule. Even though we have some, um, even though we might associate the centralization of power in a negative way, particularly given that the citizens had been electing their leaders, Augustus's rule actually marked the beginning of a period of time that was known as the Pax Romana, which you can see here is the Roman Republic. As it ends, that period of time thereafter is known as the Roman as the Roman Peace. So Pax Romana literally means Roman Peace, not unlike the Pax Mongolia, so the period of time of peace and prosperity um, led by the expansion of the Mon Mongol uh, Mongolian Empire. Uh, this Pax Romana was a 207-year period of peace, wealth, and expansion of Rome. So we're going to break each one of those facets down about the expansion, the peace, the wealth. Ultimately, building, I just want to show you a map first here. First, we can see the expansion of Pax Romana. So you can see that now the physical territory that Rome uh, controlled has expanded. We see all kinds of commerce going back and forth, meaning business and trade across both the Mediterranean and through road systems. Now, the creation of that map that you see right there, let's put it on the left-hand side right now, political success, political success on the left. There was no master plan. There wasn't a key strategy for building an empire under, under Rome. In fact, in many ways, they didn't set out to create an, an empire, but ultimately did. And what made that empire so successful um, are these four key facets, in addition to others. First, the Ro Rome had an incredibly successful road system. I'm going to detail that road system and significance thereof in just a minute. But it takes no, no uh, real thought to realize that connecting your empire through transportation systems is going to lead to some success politically. Um, in addition, when Rome expanded, every time there was a new conquered peoples, 
those conquered peoples would be conscripted, that means enlisted, into the military. In this way, the, uh, the Roman Empire is ensuring loyalty, and they're also simply building a massive, massive military. So a new territory isn't necessarily as much of a burden if those people are able to be used to defend that new territory. The military was also particularly persistent. This persistence, uh, and what I mean by that is if they were defeated, for example, if there was a defeated, defeated fleet of ships, rather than retreating and, or, and backing down, Rome simply just built more ships and built more fleets. So this persistence and this aggressive offensive military ensured quick and rapid expansion. Additionally, Rome uh, were also excellent diplomats. The word diplomats itself, so I'm assuming at this point we've got all the bolded terms on the left and the answers on the right. But if that's not the case, then do ensure at least the word diplomat makes it on the left and the definition on the right. We've learned it already because we actually learned about it under the Inca. That to be a diplomat, that means as someone who can deal with people in a sensitive and effective way. You're an effective communicator with, uh, between groups of people. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean, sensitive doesn't necessarily mean that you're taken advantage of, though. What I mean here is that Rome crushed rebellions. Any kind of rebellion against their powers solidly, quickly, and effectively crushed. Yet, when new people were conquered, they were often offered citizenship and even given some level of autonomy, which means political independence. So these new territories weren't necessarily forced into the submission that you may necessarily associate um, with a rapid empire there. So as we already mentioned, here's the map here of, the, of Pax Romana. Um, and w in addition, what also was called, in addition to political expansion, we saw all kinds of cultural and technological expansion. In this way, as you'll put on the left-hand side, Pax Romana was essentially Rome's, Rome's golden age. So just like we've seen in other, the Islamic golden age, the Chinese, go, Chinese golden age, on, in a golden age, we see all kinds of um, engineering projects. And one of the ones that's the most well-known, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, let me back that up for a second. The massive engineering would not have been successful and would not have happened if not for the use of concrete. Concrete and Rome's use of concrete is what allowed them to build the buildings that still, the uh, architecture that still to this day in many places can be found. What you see at the top right is an amphitheater. Amphitheaters are massive stadiums, and in those stadiums, uh, Rome would hold entertainment for its peoples. Specifically, the one that's most famous is the Colosseum, which you see at the top right, because the Colosseum was home to many gladiator fights. These amphitheaters were a source of community building. Amphitheaters built, were built all over the Roman Empire, and these were a way to bring people together and to unify people under the Roman Empire, as well as just simply providing entertainment. You can see in the bottom right, um, you can actually peek underneath the Colosseum there. You can see what would what you're looking at, actually, let me point to it. This is where the the um, gladiators would have been housed underneath here, and the animals and whatever beasts they'd be fighting or other gladiators would be held underneath here. This is a hypothetical representation of what the Colosseum would have looked like um, back then. And this is, the, of course, the modern-day picture. And I can't help but sneak this in here. I just want to show you a few pictures of the modern-day Colosseum. These are a few I took um, a long time ago now, but pictures of the Colosseum. It's a really cool visit, sneaking in a picture there with my brother, but you can see this is actually a view of the tunnel where the gladiators would walk out, and you can see just how incredibly massive this Colosseum was. And there's a clearer picture of what we were looking at before. So truly just incredible engineering, the circular design here, the, the fact that this is still standing in many years later. Here's an example of some of the architectural columns. This is once the Roman Forum, so this is once the center of the town where people would all come together within Rome. You can see the arches, you can see the dome pictures. Um, I actually don't remember what this picture is of, but another picture of some of the Roman relics here. Another example of the Roman arch that was famous at the time. So pretty some amazing architecture um, feats of engineering here in, in the Roman Empire, um, much of which was constructed under Pax Romana. Getting back to some of the other architects, uh, the things that they were known for. Already mentioned the roads, about to talk about them again. There were high-rise tenement buildings, that means people living in these cities. And the one that you might be familiar with are the aqueducts, those large man-made channels for moving water. So fast forwarding, I'm sorry, let me back it up for a second. Two other examples, uh, the Pantheon is another one of the major exa famous examples of the domes and the arcs. 
Um, and you can see there again, this are the inside of the Pantheon. Two, uh, some, un some really incredible engineering that we see here under Pax Romana. There's the aqueducts. The aqueducts were those man-made channels that were able to channel water, and you can see how it works. You find a reservoir of water, the conduit takes the water underneath, underground, and then the aqueducts are the actual bridges that continue channeling the water down. And if you notice that that's on a slope, then you've noticed that correctly, and you know that those your studies of algebra are not for nothing. That the calculating the slope of the line is what ensures that the water continues at an appropriate angle down. Mentioned I talked about the Roman roads, and here we are. So the Roman roads were different from other classical road systems because they were engineered to be as straight as possible. As you can see, you can compare that to the Inca roads, both very effective, as you see. But rather than um, going through bumps and, and contours in the road system, Roman roads were extremely straight which ensured the rapid deployment of troops and facilitated communication and diffusion of goods all across the Mediterranean. Another little fact about your engineering piece for Roman roads is that Roman roads were actually built on a slope here so that the middle of the road is the highest point and then that water and uh, could actually run off to the sides here, which is actually still to this day how roads are built. As you can see, I already mentioned this, so this is just a, under Pax Romana. You can see the roads allow for widespread cultural diffusion and commerce across the Mediterranean. Also under Pax Romana, there was a merit-based bureaucracy, so jobs were actually earned by people who were qualified for them. All reasons why this period of time was called the Pax Romana. However, that wouldn't last forever. What we saw, and notice that I shifted essential questions at the top, so I would recommend you either draw a line across your notes or simply add this on the left-hand side. Some way to mark the shift. This Pax Romana was not meant to last forever. And ultimately, we're going to now start laying the groundwork for what is it that's going to bring down this massive Roman Empire? What are the political, social, economic, and military challenges that are going to begin to weaken this strong place? The first is political instability. That uh, the series of good emperors, quote unquote, that's what they're called, good emperors, ended here when Mar uh, Emperor Marcus Aurelius chose his son, Commodus, to rule, who was a very ineffective and very unqualified leader. By Between 235 and 284, Rome becomes embroiled. That means deeply involved in conflicts and civil wars. And during that period of time, they had 27 different emperors. You can imagine that's incredible instability in the provinces, meaning the outer regions begin to break away. I tried to find a map that showed this well, but I couldn't, which is that the Rome was also starting to, because of this instability, was starting to face threats from outside groups who were coming in to invade in some of the outer regions. There was also a brief plague. A plague is a, is a widespread disease. Consequently, you had a drastic reduction in the population. You'll notice I'm numbering these. I invite you to do so as well. These are reasons that are weakening the uh, Roman system and the Roman Empire. Thirdly, we got economic instability. We got a lack of manpower because of the, the reduction in the population. Trade is declining and industry is declining. We don't have as much farm production. The money is starting to disappear and it's lose its value. And they've got the difficulty maintaining all those expensive armies that it's taking to protect this huge empire. So we're seeing masses, we're starting to see instability there. The most important one, however, though, is the rise of Christianity. Christianity is going to really weaken the Roman Empire as a whole. So as you've labeled number four, the social force is the rise of Christianity. We're going to pause on that for a second and now put on the left-hand side of your notes, origins of Christianity, because we're going to talk about what it is and how it begins the empire. Christianity begins with Jesus of Nazareth, who was a Jew, who was born in what is uh, then called Palestine and is in modern-day Israel, which you can see on the map here. He grew up in the region of Israel known as Galilee. And to back up for a second to understand when I said he's a Jew, Jew, as a Jew, the Jewish, I'm going to back up and talk about what his faith was about. The Jewish faith began with the prophet Abraham. Abraham, because of his belief in monotheism, um, which of course is the belief in one God, God promised him land to the land of Israel and descendants, people who would believe in something the same as him. That was a key component of the Jewish faith at the time. Monotheism, believing in one God and tracing the stories of Abraham and the later prophets. Jesus was born as a Jew into a Jewish society that believed in these same beliefs. But begin, uh, Jesus begins to preach at the age, at, as he becomes an adult that he is the God of the same God as Abraham. He is the son of that God. So we see an immediate connection between Judaism and Christianity. You can see this quote here, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill them. In other words, he's saying that I am building upon the teachings of the prophets who've come before me. Judaism and Christianity share the same roots. 
And Jesus begins to preach these messages of peace and adherence, meaning sticking to God. One of the most famous quotes is um, from his Sermon on the Mount, which says to say, Love the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus begins preaching these messages of peace. On the left-hand side, so let's bring this back to the history. So why did Christianity threaten the Roman Empire? What's the problem? Well, at the time, the emperor had been viewed as a deified figure. Deified means treated as a god. So Christianity is now going to start to tick away and chip away at that loyalty. The idea here is that for the, what was once for the glory of Rome, people believing in that what they do is all for the glory of this empire, is now going to be coming loyalty to Jesus and Christianity. So ultimately what that means is that Christians are not going to be as loyal to the, the empire as they had once been. Therefore, Jesus is seen as a threat to the Roman Empire. And a procurator, meaning that's his title, he's a military and treasury officer named Pontius Pilate, ordered the execution of Jesus because of this. He essentially was a rabble-rouser. He was causing too much trouble for the empire. And he was killed through crucifixion. Crucifixion was a common way to kill uh, prisoners and to execute people at that time, which is to be nailed on a cross. And that is why the, that process and, and Jesus' death is why Christianity is symbolized with the cross. Jesus' followers believe that he was resurrected, meaning he came back to life 40 days after he was killed. And it is that resurrection that Christians uh, feel that he is that feel is very significant and is celebrated on Easter. Christian, Christianity began to spread rapidly, but it was facing persecution, meaning those Christians were not treated well and they were um, really um, they were persecuted under two uh, key Roman emperors, Decetius and Diocletian. So you can see that the Roman they, they are seeing Christianity as a threat to their power. However, on the whole, what we see is if you've got a group of people who are all changing their faith, that we see the social forces are being laid to, to chip away at this Roman Empire, political instability, economic instability. So what is this was a fantastically strong am empire is now starting to chip away and becoming weak. So there we are. We're going to pick up the story of ultimately what causes the fall. So your prediction for number four will serve as our basis for discussion in class next class. Thanks, guys.